Gang, thanks for coming today. Uh, we've got a packed agenda. I think we're clocked in at like 34.30, so we're gonna start right at the pen. Uh, we can't take any questions to get through all of it, but I tell you what, uh, we will stay as long as it takes to answer all your questions. Um, so don't think that we're fleeing the scene or anything like that. I promise we'll be with you. Um, and I think we're about two minutes out. Thank you very much for coming in. If you guys in the back, uh, it's not like the Blue Man Group. We won't spread anything on you or anything, so feel free. Plenty of places up front. Thanks, gang. Take a picture for me. Yeah. Oh, I turned my turn my phone off. So. Once again, just a general reminder: there's no food or drink for you in this room. Call the KubeCon police on you. Right <laughs> All right. There you go. All right, that's good. Good to go? I'm good. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Shane. And this is my good friend, Will. And this whole week at KubeCon, you're going to hear amazing success story after amazing success story delivered by some of the most brilliant people in our industry. So Will and I, we're going to give you a break from all that right now. <laughs> we're going to tell you about a misadventure we had running a large-scale Kubernetes cluster. And the reason why we think you're going to be interested in this is we believe that many of you in this room right now are on this misadventure with us. It's just no one told you. Our misadventure begins where all great misadventure begins, a misunderstanding. You see, we took the things that we knew to be true in Kubernetes and misapplied all those concepts to things that were actually governed by the Linux performance rules. And it turns out that's kind of a big mistake to make. But it's an easy one to make. You see, we were thinking in cores because that's how Kubernetes thinks about stuff, right? There is a node object with the number of CPUs on it. And every time you schedule something, it decrements that object. It's definitely a thing. However, Linux has an abstraction layer and it thinks in time, not cores. Now I get it, I'm probably sounding like the crazy guy on the Kubernetes subway, right? The cores are a lot. So let me explain that for just a second, okay? So I'm gonna use the least controversial feature in all of Kubernetes to explain this, Kubernetes limits. Now I know, I know, right? There's, there's a little bit, take how you feel about Kubernetes limits and put that aside for me for just a second because it is the best way to understand how Kubernetes thinks in time and how dangerous it can be to think in cores. Just as a quick review, there is metadata attached to a container, a specific container for how much CPU it can take in a given period of time. That period of time happens to be 100 milliseconds. Just follow that number away for me real quick. We'll need that in just a few slides. And every period we reset this quota of limits. Pretty straightforward, right? But what I didn't understand is when I was configuring cores, what was really going on behind the scenes is it was converting into time. Let's explain how that works really quickly. See, in my mind, I was configuring one core, and that's broken up into 1,000 little chunks called milli CPU, right? And if I configure 10 milli CPU, which is the minimum value, what I'm really saying here is whatever value that I configure divided by that base value of one CPU or 1,000 millicores, there's a percentage. But a percentage of what? It's 1% of this 100 millisecond period in time, or one millisecond, which is why that's the smallest value. Now, how is that different? So someone would come up to me and like, Shane, my application needs half a core. Sounds pretty reasonable, sure. But what's happening when I convert that into time? You see, that is 
of that 100 millisecond period or 50 milliseconds in time. How is 50 milliseconds in time different from half a core? Well, you see, I didn't think to have the good sense to ask them anything about this app. And it turns out with our fictitious app, we have four threads running on four cores. And if I add up the total bill, the total amount of CPU utilization in this 100 milliseconds of time that's passing in the real world, I get 400 milliseconds that I've just said, no, that was nowhere near the 50 that I thought. When I'm thinking in time, it sounds reasonable, but let's take a step back, right? If, if uh, can anyone tell you the right way to set your limits if they didn't know this information, how many threads you're running, how you're gonna, uh, how many parallel processes? Actually, one person can. It turns out Prometheus can. So by using the familiar C advisor metric container, CPU usage seconds total, now this is in seconds, so we're gonna do a little prom foo, right, prom QL, and convert that into periods, right? We're gonna save all that, I promise I'll share that with you at the end. But when we measure that in time, what's the value? Exactly the amount that we needed to set it for to keep it from throttling. Did I need a Ouija board, right? A dream catcher and 5 million blogs to set it? No, I just needed like a five second chart and Prometheus to get this all down. Was it really that hard? It's not when you're thinking in time. Okay, Shane, is it really that easy? All right. I left a few things out, so let's cover that. Our application, we decided to do the number of threads static, but we had an option to have that go dynamic with user load. What would happen? As the load goes up, would the value be the same if the thread count was dynamic? In fact, it would not be. Whoops. Thinking in terms of static can be highly dangerous. More on that in just a second. But how does this affect things in the real world? Well, you see, I've got four cores that I'm running in test, right? And so I'm running like a runtime, maybe like Golang or something that says, oh, cool, you gave me four cores. Well, I'm going to run four OS threads and I'll run my Go routines on that. Well, what happens when I go to production and I give it an eight core box? It's going to go, oh, you gave me eight cores. Great. Is the number for performance going to measure out to be the same if I have eight OS threads? In fact, it's not. Whoops. Whoops. So a few things that we have to think about when we do this sort of thing. Cool. So you get this wrong like I got it wrong. I used to start to do these percentage of periods and all this type of stuff, and I wasn't thinking in time. So I'd go to Will, all judgy and stuff, right? I'd be like, Will, you're 99% throttled on your application. How could you? And he'd be like, oh, oh, dude, dude, what do we set it for? And I'd be like, I don't know, right? And so, uh, because, you know, it's just some random percentage up there. And he'd look at me all disappointed, kind of like you're looking at me right now, sir. And, and I'd be like, man, there's got to be a better way to do this, right? Well, you see, I'd go back and I'd do my engineering, right? Because I'm an engineer, I got this, right? We'll double it, right? He's running one. We'll run two cores because that sounds good to my ear. Oh, you've done it. Don't you judge me, right? <laughs> and so... I do two cores now, right? That sounds like a lot. But when we think in time, immediately we see the problem. So just converting between these two, pretty simple. Just drop the zero, right? Going back and forth. And what is it? 200 milliseconds time. What did I just do? Man, I just halved his application performance. Sorry, buddy. Right? And in that 100 milliseconds of time, if I didn't have another application that needed to run, guess what? It goes out as idle. Right? So I got 50% utilization, but I got a huge performance problem. That would be a monstrous problem to try to figure out unless we were thinking in time. You see, luckily I have the CPU seconds throttled total. And if I just convert that to periods, and again, I'll share this with you. Lo and behold, what number is it? The exact number I need to raise it by, right? I had 200. I needed to add an extra 200 to get it to 400. The exact value I needed to stop the throttles. Stuff's actually quite simple. It was just two little charts I needed to look at for five seconds. And I didn't need all this stuff that's been going on for years, right? But I know exactly what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, shame. You didn't even cover per CPU slice allocation on the global container for the metadata of the container. What kind of amateur night are you running up there, man? 
that's a little harsh, but I got you, fam. Don't worry. I wrote a whole blog post going into the brain damage details of all this. Now, I know the, the grandmaster of Kubernetes himself, Tim Hawkins, tried to get us not to shoot ourselves in the foot years ago. But there's actually some cool stuff coming out. You see, in a new version of the Linux kernel that's coming, uh, there's rollover and burst values for the stuff, so limits might be cool again. But more importantly, you're in a multi-tenant talk right now. And us as multi-tenant operators, we don't get to control what people do in our containers. We need a safety net. And if you need a safety net, this stuff's actually not too bad if you think in time. Now someone, if not all of you, are gonna send me this, oh, but you can do all this stuff with request. It turns out that's actually a more fascinating topic and might not work quite like you think. To discuss that, let's go explore that universe for just a bit. The gentleman on the slide's name is Edwin Hubble. And about two hours from where I live in Los Angeles, back in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble provided direct evidence that the universe was expanding at a faster and faster rate. Now, some mathematicians at the time were pretty bummed because their whole life's work was on the universe was static, right? Overnight, just completely bad. This makes me feel a lot better because all my math and all my performance calculations on Linux were wrong because I thought the Linux universe was static. Now, I don't want to brag, but when I was in the United States Marine Corps, I was so good at basic math, they gave me a special box of crayons to do hard things like ratios, right? So when it came to take my CKA course, I was feeling pretty confident. I'm like, I got this. Now tell me if you learned the same thing, right? So one request equals 1024 shares. And if I got double those amount of requests, I get double the amount of shares. And just like Shares at a company, whoever gets the most shares gets a greater percentage of the company, right? So in my mind, it worked like this. This application got 25% of the shares. This application got 50% of the shares, except none of that is true. I'm reading my hero, uh, Brendan Gregg, right? Who makes me feel like I probably should be working at Best Buy and not doing this. But he says, hey, Crayon Eater, guess what? It's only the busy shares that count. Wait, what? So you mean if this container is idle, it doesn't count in the performance calculation, it's just these two? That completely changes my performance ratio on this node. Oh my goodness. But wait a minute, wait a minute. I have hundreds of pods. Forget containers, I got startup containers, and I'd rather try to figure out the heat death of the universe than try to figure out like what container is going to be busy at any given time. If I could do that kind of math, I would have gotten to ML. Right? <laughs> and would it be the same if I could calculate it on a node? Would it be on all, all thousand nodes? No, it wouldn't. Uh-oh, I'm getting a little anxious now, right? But is this practical? You see, when I was thinking in cores, a developer would come up to me and like, can I have a core? Sure, buddy, here you go, right? But what was actually happening, let's say, just to stretch a point, we were, we were working in stage. Would all the containers be busy in stage like they are in prod? No. So I do some performance regression. You all do performance regression on your apps, right? I know, I know. So we do a little performance regression, and what happens? It takes up that entire node because nothing else is going on, right? If I was thinking in cores, I'd be convinced I had another core, but I'm actually taking up the whole box. Whoops. What happens when I move to production? Would I get the same performance profile? Indeed, I wouldn't. I'd be like, what's going on? And would that be the same across all 1,000 boxes that we're running? And our thing, no. Oh my goodness, okay. So now I'm just disillusioned, right? I'm screaming at the lens, gods, why does this have to be so brain damaging, right? And it turns out it was just my mental model was all wrong. You see, once these tasks or threads get put on a particular CPU, right? Really what we're talking about, this weighted share system is who gets to run next on that particular CPU, oh. Well, that kind of makes sense now, because if this task doesn't need to run on CPU, does it need to be in that share calculation of who gets to run on next? No. Oh, thank goodness. Now I understand. I just misunderstood all of Kubernetes. No big deal, right? Oh, goodness. Okay. To really understand this, though, we'll have to do the completely fair scheduler. And gang, we have 30 seconds per slide, so I need a little overconfidence from me in the crowd right now. We're going to learn the completely fair scheduler in exactly 30 seconds. Are you feeling it this morning? Are you ready? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right. A little delusional overconfidence, right? All right, gang, will time us. Go. <laughs> <laughs>
Sweet. All right, gang. This task is running 100 milliseconds on this CPU. It is hogging up all this CPU time. Meanwhile, this poor task is waiting patiently for that CPU. It has only had 10 milliseconds of runtime on the CPU. That's not fair. Linux fair scheduler to the rescue. It sees this and it says, wait a minute. This task has the lowest runtime. Let's put that on CPU. Once these two a task have the same amount of time or their fair share of the CPU time, bam, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, completely fair schedule. Time. 39. Oh, come see my presentation at Overconfidence tomorrow. I'm going to kill it. It'll be much better, I promise. All right. Damn it. All right. All right, so why did I take you through that? Okay. What is a request at the end of the day? A little hand wavy here, but bear with me. All right, I got my CPU hog is back. Runtime, 100 milliseconds in time. What I'm actually saying here with request is one is divide this runtime by the number of shares. This is some advanced crayon math, hang with me, but when you divide a number, evidently it makes it smaller, right? <laughs> and so when you have the shortest runtime, as you guys are already experts at now, right? The shortest time is the highest priority, right? Cool. And if I was to increase that value, it's even shorter. Oh my goodness, we're messing with time again. Wow, okay. All right, so let's think about this for a minute. But am I the master and commander of everything that's going in the node? Or is there maybe something else that might be in play? We call that leading the witness, right? Okay, here we go. All right, there was something I didn't tell you in all this. And that was that that 10 millisecond task was waiting on IO. And so what was happening is it didn't even need to run on CPU. Now, if I was running a real-time scheduler, what would happen? This CPU hog would get interrupted every so often, right? Hey, you know, do I need to run something? No, no, no. And I would waste all those CPU cycles. We don't want that. That's where CFS shines, right? So I want to let the CPU hog run as long as it wants. And when this packet comes back, I set a flag saying I need to run. And I want it to run it as fast as possible. And you know what happens from here, right? Lowest time wins, right? It goes in, but it's an I.O. task, so I want you to think about this. It's probably going to run on CPU for very small and then go back. I.O. tasks by default are probably going to be the smallest time. What starts happening when I do aggressive requests and all this type of stuff on something that's already pretty aggressive, right? Oh, wait, there's a lot going on here, evidently. Cool. So how did I get this fictitious version of the universe? Right? Well, it turns out, you know, I did CPU stress and all the containers at the same time. And we know if all containers are busy, that doesn't happen in the real world, right? I ran the node at 100% busy. Hopefully that's not happening in the real world, right? I had a fixed number of threads when they could be dynamic. And I had no I.O. based things. So I got this, like, fictitious version of the universe and how that worked. Okay, so what would be this new mental model that I would have to... Pen, like what would that look like? And in my head, it looks something like this. So I have two containers, we'll call them task groups, each with four threads or tasks in them. There's a million places we can go with this, but I'm gonna focus on this concept of saturation. You see, this is what my node really looks like. And on this CPU, I have one task. It's all, so the caches are all warm. It's at its peak performance. However, this one where I have two tasks going on, it's gonna take double the amount of time right, to get that same resource. Now, what I didn't know is if the CPU wasn't 100%, man, I was packing that note as dense as a neutron star, right? What, what's the big deal? Well, it turns out maybe that wasn't the best. But to understand that, I want you to do a thought experiment with me real quick, gang. Let's just pretend, right, that these two CPUs are 100% utilized. I'm going to stretch a point to make a point here, right? But this task is actually perfect, right? There, it's 100% it's utilized, but that's fine, right? Because it's perfectly optimized. But you let me bin pack your notes, so on this side, oh my goodness, right? I've got so many task context switching, I'm not getting any real work done. Whoops, right? So it turns out, would I see this saturation metric that I've saturated this with utilization? In fact, I wouldn't. But I would argue, gang, as multi-tenant people that need to do these things super dense, that's the more important metric out of the two. 
Now, I'm a little crestfallen. I'm not going to win the Nobel Prize for any of this. It looks like uh, there has been a family of node metrics called pressure stall information that tell you all of this wonderful data, right? We just didn't know to turn it on, right? And when we did, the, the findings were pretty crazy. So sure, okay, there was like, you know, 50% of threads waiting and all that type of stuff. Maybe we should use go max procs or something to limit the thread counts and stuff like that. But interestingly enough, that wasn't the most interesting thing that we found. We found that we were stalled on memory up to 10%. We were thrashing the memories on the box. They were saturated. And the most fascinating thing was IO. Stalled means every single thread on the box was stalled. Up to 35% of the time. Whoops. Because we weren't even looking at this sort of thing. There is all kinds of amazing work uh, by uh, guys like Chris Down that did like C Groups version 2 and the meta Facebook guys um, that I really recommend that you watch. But the, the point is, I was super excited about all this. And I was thinking, who do I know that runs a large-scale multi-tenant cluster? My buddy Will. So I pick up the phone. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, Will, guess what? I don't know anything about Kubernetes. And he's like, oh, I know, man. I know. Why don't you tell me what's going on? And I was like, uh, jabbering on like a monkey. And I'm like, yeah, all right, all right, Shane. Click. Hey, babe, I think, uh, I think Shane hit his head bungee jumping again. But in the morning, I started thinking about some of these decisions that we'd made at Acquia in a little bit of a different light. See, we were scaling our customer workloads on CPU utilization as a percent of requests. And I mean, that's a Kubernetes default, right? It practically comes out of the box. So could it really have bit us that bad? Well, it turns out it could. This is one customer namespace over a period of like a week. And you can see we're running hundreds of nodes an hour, thousands a day, that it turns out, after I looked into it a little bit, we did not need. <laughs> Their load did not look like this. Right? So we have all this churn, but why? Well, what is percent of requests? I never really thought about it before, but when Shane tells us all this about requests, I mean, he's talking about these weights, right? And like the Linux fair scheduler and stuff like that. He's not talking about like using a certain percent of your weight, right? What does that even mean? Well, it turns out in this context, right, percent of requests is simply the actual CPU usage per second on average, and remember Linux thinks in time, right? So this is, a, this is the amount of time that something's spent on the CPU. Well, not something, actually, to be specific, it's all the processes and all the threads in that container added up on average per second, and we just divide that by the request. So if something ran for 500 milliseconds per second on average, on the CPU, and it requested 1,000 millicores, we just take those units, we throw them out the window, and we do 500 divided by 1,000, and we get 50% of requests. Right? Simple enough. Well, with that in mind, let's revisit an example that Shane gave us a little earlier. Let's take two containers. Right? We're going to run them as hot as they can. They're just going to eat up as much CPU as possible. The first container, we're going to give one core, right, in its request, and the second, we're going to give three. It shouldn't surprise us at this point that on a four-core node, that first container is going to get one CPU second on average, and the second one's going to get three. And when we do that division out with Shane's special box of crayons, we do one second divided by one core, and we get 100%. Simple enough, right? I mean, this is kind of intuitively how we would expect all this stuff to work. But what happens if we change those requests around a little bit? See, Shane tells us it's just the ratio of these requests that matter, right? So as far as Linux is concerned, whether it's one core and three cores, or 100 millicores and 300 millicores, it is actually, honest to goodness, as far as Linux is concerned, the same exact situation. 
right? So we get the same performance, one second and three seconds. But when we do that math with our Kubernetes brains, right, we take one second divided by 100 millicores, and we get 1,000% of requests. Now, that's a little misleading, right? I mean, it's wildly different numbers, 100% and 1,000%, that both describe the exact same situation as far as Linux sees it. But I wasn't quite convinced at this point, right? I mean, that's interesting and odd, maybe, you know, not how I expected that it would work. But Shane's asking me to basically redo my entire scaling metric for all, you know, 5,000, 6,000 of our, of our customers. So, uh, you know, I needed to dive a little deeper on this. See, what we're doing, really, when we're calculating this percent request and we're thinking this way, we're comparing what's essentially a performance metric, right? How, how long something's running with a number that, frankly, we're, we're just kind of using to figure out how many pods we want to run on that node, right? How densely we want to pack that node, which, as Shane talks about, is maybe a little bit more complicated. And we're doing that comparison between these two concepts with really no regard to how Linux actually views that number. And sometimes, don't get me wrong, sometimes that comparison is a perfectly valid one to make. It gives us a lot of information. But by no means does it give us a complete an accurate view of what's actually going on within the system. Let's look at a more extreme example of this. Let's say we have just one container. And every time it gets a request, like a web request or something, it, it has some work to churn through. And that work takes about eight seconds of CPU time. But let's say we weren't thinking in time, right? Let's say, OK, well, that's a pretty big container, right? It's doing a lot of work. I'll give it four cores. Right, four cores has to be enough, right? It ran on a four core box of four, four cores is plenty. Well, what happens when we try to run that on Kubernetes? We send that up to the API server and it says, great, you want four cores? I'll give you four cores, here you go. But let's say it schedules us on an eight core node. Well, when that container comes up on Linux and there's nothing else running on the box, it can really spread out, right, over all eight cores which means it can get its eight seconds of work done in just one second of real time, which is wonderful, right? I mean, we're getting a lot of work done as fast as we can. But when we look at this, when we look at our metrics, we're going to see eight seconds divided by four cores. That's 200% of requests. Oh, no, we say, right? 200% of requests. We must be overloaded. We must be putting too much work on this pod. So what do we do as Kubernetes aficionados when something's overloaded? We scale up, right? We add another pod. So let's say we do. Let's say we just set that, you know, dash, dash, scale, replicas, two, done. Next pod comes up. Kubernetes helps us out, right? Doesn't want to waste space. Puts us on the same node, gives us another four cores. But now when that container comes up, it's not a free range anymore, right? Linux has to constrain both of those workloads equally, because they have the same requests, to 50% of the time. So now in each one second of real time, they only get four seconds on the CPU each. But when we look at our percent of requests, we're going to say, OK, four seconds over four cores, 100% of requests. Right? Hooray! We solved the problem. We're, we're not overloaded anymore. But is this, is this a good thing? Did we help? I mean, we still have the same eight seconds of work, right? That didn't change. But in the first case, when we have one container, it's getting it done in one second. And by adding that second container, we're doubling the amount of time it takes to get that work done. But if we just look at this percent of requests, which is all the HPA is doing, right? We, we could be misleading ourselves pretty easily to think that we're actually helping, that we're actually doing something good, right? Now, OK, fine. Requests, maybe, maybe it's a little misleading, right? Maybe it's a little not the whole picture, right? But maybe we should be asking ourselves a little bit of, uh, you know, we should back it up a little bit. Maybe we should ask a more fundamental question. What makes us think that CPU is the right metric to scale our workloads on at all. Well, let's take these two web applications. Let's say they're both saturated, they're, right? They're both taking as many web requests as they possibly can. The one on the left, though, right? Every web request it's getting, it's just doing some data processing, right? Number crunching, something like that. 
That all shows up on the CPU, wonderful. But more typical web applications, right, they don't necessarily do that. Let's say we're waiting on a database, or maybe we're calling out to some external thing. It doesn't really matter. None of that shows up as CPU utilization. So we have two wildly different CPU utilizations and the same saturation. It turns out that CPU utilization, right, it just tells us what the app is doing, namely, whether it's spending its you know, free time on the CPU or whether it's doing something else. Well, fine, okay, at this point, you know, I give Shane a call back, and I say, Shane, I don't say this enough, but you were right. <laughs> I don't like percenter requests anymore, right? It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't, I can't trust it. Uh, CPU, you know, it doesn't even work for my application. What do I do? What do I scale on? How do I solve this problem, right? And he looks at me with that confident glint in his eyes, that 39 second confident glint in his eyes. <laughs> and, and he says, Obviously, scale on request a second. Right? Which is what all the blogs say, right? Request per second. Scale your applications are request per second because of that specific CPU problem. But it turns out, request per second has kind of exactly the same problem. See, we run a lot of different applications at Acquia, right? Some, let's say they're really simple sites. Maybe they're serving static content or something, right? Not a complicated request to fulfill. So that can take a lot of requests per second. But the more complicated sites, right, spending a lot of time in the database, maybe they have some crazy back-end proprietary stuff, or, or let's be honest, maybe they're just not the most optimized in the world, right? They can't take as many requests per second. No judgment. Um, requests per second, just like CPU, right, it tells us what the application is doing, namely how fast it's processing requests, but it doesn't give us that context to tell us how many more it can do before we actually need another replica, before, before it's gonna fall over. So we really sat back and we thought about it and we said, okay, what do we wanna scale on? And we decided that any metric that's worth scaling on needs to, at the very least, it needs to be highly correlated with what's actually going on inside the application, right? <laughs> at the very least. We wanted something smooth, right? We didn't want these big spikes up and down and wasting all that time scheduling all those pods. And lastly, we wanted an early enough signal that we could actually respond to it, right? So not something like latency, which, sure, is very highly correlated, right? But if you're already having high latency, then you've already failed, right? You're scaling too late. See, every application has this kind of curve as you apply load. When the load's light, right, your application can handle it no problem. But maybe it's not as utilized as it otherwise could be. And if you scale at that point, right, you end up just kind of scaling empty, right? We're not taking as much uh, as a good advantage of the resources we're, we have available to it. But if you push that load too far, right, you end up introducing latency or drops or errors or crashes or ooms or whatever, right? Like you end, well, hopefully not ooms, but you, you end up with issues in your application, right? What we were looking for is a metric that told us where that inflection point was. Right, right before we start introducing issues. And we wanted to set our HPA to a little bit before that. Right? The idea being that as we scaled up and down, we would be holding the majority of our replicas in that optimized zone. Right? Now for us, that ended up being essentially the number of threads that were active at any one time. Right? It didn't tell us what those threads were doing, um, and it didn't need to. It just told us, hey, they're busy. They can't take another request, right? And when you have a fixed number of threads, like Shane was saying, you know kind of how much of that you can take until you need another replica. Now, for you, this metric is very likely to be something very different, right? Depending on the application and the language and all that. But the point is the process we went through to find that metric, it forced us to learn a lot about our application, about what happened when we apply load to it, and what it looked like when it was about to fall over, right? And I'm happy to report, we started rolling this out to production, and we drastically reduced the churn, right? Turns out, when you're scaling on the proper metric, maybe you don't need to be running 73,000 buds every single day, 
right? <laughs> now when our customers scale, it's because they actually need to, right? It's because they, they need the threads, which makes us really happy because it greatly simplifies our cluster setup, right? We don't have these crazy churn and all the problems that come with it, and that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> um, and it makes our customers happy, right? Because a lot of customers aren't particularly CPU heavy, right? Sometimes they wait a long time in the database and now they scale just as well as those, well, better, everybody scales better, but just as well as the people that used high CPU originally. There we go. Gang, our time together is at an end. But uh, two things before you go. You see, we got caught up that what we needed was WebAssembly base injected Envoy BPF, Whoa! And it was the fundamentals that we had wrong the whole time. And when we focused on those fundamentals, that's when we got the biggest gain. And we thought someone was going to come on a silver platter with this best practices thing, and it was always wrong because we had to measure what was going on to really understand what the best practices were for our cluster. And it turns out that Prometheus is the way to do that, but it turns out everything we knew about all that stuff was wrong too, and that's an even more fascinating universe, but that's a tale for another day. On a personal note, gang, uh, I just want to give you a heartfelt, <laughs> I got rejected for KubeCon three times in a row, and this is like my last big thing. And so the fact that it's like standing room only and 700 of you guys showed up, I can't tell you what that means to us. This was a big labor of love. We spent three months on it. Um, we'd love to get your feedback if uh, you dig this kind of stuff or you'd rather hear from like adults on this sort of thing in the future. <laughs> so if you fill that out, I'd be grateful. Gang, we will stay as long as it takes to answer all your questions. We're sorry we couldn't take them live. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your KubeCon. <laughs>